This is Twit. I have maybe two questions in one, and um, one of them is um, about the the overall population, the sort of what the talent pool is. And I started on this topic with Linux Journal in 1994, which is actually four years before the term open source was used. Um, and in those days, and even into the aughts, maybe even well into the aughts uh, in this millennium, um, most of the people working in open source were self-taught because they were dealing with something that wasn't necessarily taught in school. And they were scratching their own itches and they were coming up with a lot of the code that we're now using is sort of the, 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 al the alpha codes that are, that are in everybody's life. And even in the case of Git, uh, which you mentioned earlier, um, Linus Torvalds invented that when he, <laughs> when he needed it. So he lightning struck twice in that case. But in that case, it wasn't even a professional need. It was kind of like, I just, I just need a, a better way to do this than BitKeeper, which is what he's using up to that, that point. So where I'm going with this is that there was a, a talent pool early on that was mostly self-taught. And, and I'm wondering where the place, and this is my, sort of my second question, my second point that could be a question is, um, where does that talent pool go now, right, where people are kind of still teaching themselves up to coming up with new kinds of code, but there is in the world now such a large abundance of companies that have a crying need for open source developers because they're using open source code of many, many kinds. So there's this, there's this big attraction that large companies have in hiring. People already know stuff, but there's also still this imperative to invent your own stuff at the same time and to be self-taught and not even learn it at a boot camp. You're just busy teaching yourself at home or with your friends. And so I'm looking for a way to sort of reconcile those two imperatives, the corporate need on the one hand for talent that's already qualified and the inventive need on the part of individuals to do creative stuff like they always did. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great observation, Doc. The I think there really our perspective is there really are two different audiences here. There's the audience of folks who have the right um, aptitudes to be able to get in and truly teach themselves something. And for those folks, you know, you hear this, uh, I, somebody, but back when we used to have conferences before COVID, uh, I was chatting with someone and they said, you know, uh, GitHub patches are the new resume uh, because that's what people mm -hmm. can see and instantly believe, wow, okay, might have been an obscure topic, but you got a patch submitted and it went up the food chain and got merged in. That's great. Uh, that pool will always be there, folks who are self-motivated. I think the big challenge that we have seen is that may only be 10 or 15% of the potential population. The, the big pool of folks... Uh, for instance, if you're coming from an underprivileged background in a, in a city, you might not know anybody who's ever done this type of career, and you may not really have been exposed to it. And so if you're on the outside looking in, it's it can be very daunting to try to figure out, hey, I'm just going to start, I'm just going to teach it to myself. And so I think figuring out how do you bring the folks who don't have that set of aptitudes to jump in and do it themselves and, you know, hop on the IRC channels and hop on, you know, the Reddit threads and figure it out and interact with people. Um, you have to keep both audiences in mind. They're, they're, they're quite different audiences. And the that initial smaller audience of the folks, you know, the, the future leanesses of the world, uh, they have a much entry guide path and entry path into these types of careers. And they're the ones who are going to have their own, you know, hobby projects in GitHub, and they're going to be looking to, to uh, contribute patches to projects that they're using. Uh, that's great, but that's not a large enough audience. And so uh, part of the challenge that we try to address is, you know, for the, you know, for every one of those folks, there's eight or nine folks who don't have the background, the experience, the confidence, frankly, to jump in and try to do this on their own. How do we get them on ramps into this? Because if you get folks in and they get build their confidence and they build their awareness, at some point they flip into that other audience and they have the confidence to be able to go in and submit patches and work with others and collaborate. But the uh, the barrier to entry can seem a little high, and so a lot of what we have been trying to focus on is how do we get more people over the hump 
to the point where they can be self-sustaining. And a lot, and that really has to do with making the programs accessible, making them affordable, making them high quality, vendor neutral, and uh, allowing people to feel comfortable stepping into this. Yeah, I, I keep thinking back to that famous, I think it was a New Yorker cartoon back in the late 90s. Uh, you know, two dogs in an apartment and, and one is telling the other, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Uh, one of the beauties of the internet is you can step into training programs and start participating and start learning. And it doesn't matter if you're a underrepresented group or not, right? You're just, everybody else, you're just your user handle. And so I think finding ways to reduce those barriers to entry, whether they're real or perceived, is a really important part of tr truly tapping into the full availability of talent that's out there. Um, so that so that we don't end up in a situation where the lack of talent becomes an anchor that is pulling back on the adoption on um, deployment of these technologies.